scripture reading this morning will come from Acts chapter 5, verses 34 through 42. It is really good to see each of you out this morning on a beautiful Lord's Day. We appreciate each one's attendance here. If you're visiting with us, we certainly want to invite you back anytime you have the opportunity to be with us. If you are visiting, we have some visitors' packets that Brother Barry Cook is going to pass out to you. We hope you'll raise your hand and get one of those. Fill it out, and there's a card in there that will be picked up during the song service this morning. So we'll have a record of your attendance. Acts chapter 5, verses 34 through 42. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago... Theodos rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But it is, if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. If you wish to follow along in the songbook, the first song will be number 37. Three hundred forty five.
number 288. Following the singing of this song, Brother Justin will lead us in our opening prayer. 288. <clears throat> I knew. Shall we go to God in prayer? Our almighty, glorious Heavenly Father, we humbly bow our heads to you this morning as we approach your wonderful throne of grace. Father, we are delighted and thankful for the opportunity to be together together as Christians, to worship you in spirit and in truth, to be able to praise you, to give back to you, Father and to remember the sacrifice of Jesus. Father, we pray that you will be with us through this service. Pray that everything that we do is pleasing unto you, Father. We pray that we are attentive to the words that Brother Edward is about to speak to us, Father. And we pray that we will examine ourselves. And Father, we pray that the need needs to be made known that it will. Father, we are thankful for each and every member of this congregation that meets here and worships together. Father, we pray for your blessings upon this congregation, upon each and every one of us as members of this congregation. Father, we pray that we will seek to do the will of the body, Father, that we will seek to glorify you, to share your light with those that we come into contact with and have an impact on this world. Father, we pray for our shepherds of this congregation as they Lead us spiritually, Lord, and make the decisions uh, that will have an impact on us, Father. We are thankful for their, their work and their willingness to do that work. We pray for strength and guidance, Father. We are thankful for the deacons who fulfill the various physical works of the congregation that are needed in order for it to uh, operate, Lord. We are thankful for them as well. We are thankful for Brother Edward and his ministry and the work that he does for us and breaking to us the bread of life. Father, we're thankful uh, for everything that we have in this congregation. Lord, we ask that you be with those of our number, those that are on our sick list, Lord, and those that are on our mind. Pray that you be with them, help to strengthen them, help to bring them comfort now in their time of need. Father, we pray for our country, pray for the leaders of our country, Father, we 
ask that you be with them as they make the decisions to, to guide us with policy, Father, that they will look to you for guidance. And we pray, Lord, for those of this world uh, who are not of the body. Father, we pray that may something be done to reach those souls of the world, Lord, that we can do everything that we can to spread that word, to share your love with those that we come into contact with. Father, we pray that they will be receptive of it. Father, we are so thankful for your word that you have blessed us with, that you provided for us. Father, we pray that we will open it up, that we will study it, to seek to grow in knowledge, seek to grow in faith, and seek to grow closer to you in our relationship. Father, we're thankful for your grace, for your mercy, for your providing of your son and your scheme of redemption from the foundation of the world to give us a, a way out from our sinful nature. Father, we know that we fall short of your glory and we pray for forgiveness of our sins. We know that you're willing to forgive us of those sins as we repent. And we're thankful for the blood of Jesus that allows us to have that forgiveness of sin. Father, we thank you for everything that you provided for us. We pray that we will seek to do your will and glorify you in all things. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you wish to mark the psalm invitation, will be number 50. Number 50. Now we'll sing number 282. We welcome you to our services this morning. We express to especially those who are visiting with us uh, our gratitude for your being here and being a part of our assembly today. And uh, some who have been away from us are back and maybe some others are out of town, but we're glad to see all of you this morning. I do, uh, yeah, here we go. I was about to think my remote was not working, but it is back there. The remote guy back there is doing it. We appreciate so much those who do help us out electronically and uh, those who help with the PowerPoint and all of that, and that is very helpful in getting a chart up before us. We used to paint our own charts, and now we can just type them in on a computer and get them. A couple of our ushers have the study guides available, so get their attention as they come down the aisle and 
and get one and take some notes on this morning's lesson if you would. We want to remember those who are in the path of Hurricane Harvey. Kyle Asbell is out in that area and I think he is okay this morning as far as mom and dad know and, and uh, so that's good. They're getting torrential rains out there. And David may be, may be heading out there with the Red Cross later and so let's keep those in our prayers. I noticed last night on the news that three semi-trailer loads are loaded up and ready to go from disaster relief as soon as they find out uh, where the greatest needs are and we're happy that we can be a, a small part of that good work, a great work and millions and millions of dollars <clears throat> of aid are sent each year to people who go through uh, such things as they're suffering in Texas right now. So let's remember all of those people in our prayers. The question we're posing this morning for your consideration is, what kind of a church does Jesus want? You know, people talk all the time about the kind of church they want, the kind of church they're looking for, and just seeking out to find something that will just make them so happy and pleased and just some uh, group of people that will be able to meet all of the needs of this individual who is searching for a church. But I'm convinced that one of the most important questions that needs to be asked is, what kind of a church does Jesus want? We went through that period of time several years ago where the question was being asked, what would Jesus do? That's a good question. And I remember that question being asked even back when I was in college, back in the Stone Age. That, uh, that's a very good question to ask, what would Jesus do? But when it comes to selecting a church, we need to be asking, what kind of a church does Jesus really want? The scriptures help us out about that. We can answer that question from the scriptures by looking at what Jesus himself said and looking at what the apostles that he chose and to whom he sent the Holy Spirit to guide them into all truth. Seeing what they have to say about the matter of the church and what kind of a church is it that Jesus wants. In Ephesians chapter 5, a passage that is rather familiar to most of us, but in verses 25 through 27, Paul instructed this way, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. That, now he's about to tell you why he loved the church and gave himself for it. What was his purpose in doing that? To what end was this done? That he might present it or that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word. Here's the second that. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Now there is the kind of church that Jesus wants. Paul lays it out before us in beautiful, eloquent language that is very, very meaningful to the person who is interested in knowing what kind of a church Jesus wants. You'll notice some key words that he might sanctify. That means to set apart. The church is to be made up of people who are set apart from the world for a specific purpose. To bring honor and glory to God. To do the will of the Heavenly Father, not their own. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. That's the attitude 
that members of the Lord's church are to have. To do the will of the Father. Why? Because we've been set aside to do precisely that. Not when it's convenient, not when it's easy, but all the time. Notice he says furthermore that he might cleanse it. He wants a church that is pure, that is clean. How is it cleansed? By the washing of water by the word. Clearly a reference to the matter of baptism. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 16. Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins. A carrying away of your sins. And then in Acts twenty two sixteen, why do you tarry, Saul? Arise and be baptized, hear him now, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Is it simply the power of the water? No, it's the power of the blood of Christ, which was shed in his death, and as we are baptized into his death, we reach the benefits of his death, wherein His blood was shed and are thereby cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. In just a little while, we'll be singing, Lord willing, that beautiful hymn, Are You Washed in the Blood? In the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb, that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word. When the Word (coughs) was preached in the book of Acts, And people responded in baptism to the preaching of that word. That was this passage being fulfilled. The washing of the water by the word. They were obeying the word, obeying the truth. And they would therefore be cleansed from their sins. That he might present it to himself. The church is presented to Christ as His bride. Romans 7 reminds us that we are married to Christ. And so it is that as we, the church, are presented to Christ, when we obey the gospel, we're presented to Him as a part of His holy bride. But the church is also going to be presented To him, in the end, the kingdom shall be delivered up to God. 1 Corinthians 15, 24. And it is to be pure and holy and without blemish. No spot, no wrinkle. Now, I can remember when everything was washed and ironed. There was none of this no iron stuff when I was growing up. But if a shirt had a spot in it, something was done, I've even known occasionally of the shirt shirt being dyed the color of the spot. So it would be, the spot would not be conspicuous. And uh, sometimes, though I had another, you could just cut the hole out, I mean cut the spot out, and you know, that would make the shirt more holy than righteous, I guess. But, You you don't want a spot in a white tablecloth or a white shirt. I remember years ago, I have this habit of, I always carry this type of ink pen, and sometimes I leave it like that, stick it in my shirt pocket. Barbara will say, you've got ink on that shirt, you can't wear it anymore, because there's a spot there. Something spotted is draws attention. Without wrinkle. You didn't want any wrinkles in your shirt. Everything was starched and ironed. And it did make it look very impressive. It was very clean looking. Without blemish. This harkens back to the offering of the animals in the Old Testament. The ones that were to be offered as sacrifices were to be without blemish. If a lamb had a lame leg, it didn't qualify as a sacrifice. 
If it was sickly and about to die, it didn't qualify as sacrifice. That would have been a blemished animal. If you ever went to the stock sale much at all, I can remember when farmers would be sitting there and selling an animal, and they would call out to the auctioneer, this animal is sound. They meant that this animal is healthy and in good health as far as they knew. I know of one man, I knew one man who sold an animal to a person one time and, and he found, uh, found out later that the animal had a defect and he went and gave money back to the man who purchased the animal. He said, I cannot sell you that animal. I didn't notice it. I didn't know it. But I found out about it and I don't want you thinking that I would sell you an animal that was not sound. Well, we need to think about those principles in reference to the Lord's church. He wants the church to be without spot, wrinkle, without blemish, or any such thing, anything that will take away from its beauty and its glory. Now that basically is what the Lord wants in His church. How is that expressed? How do we do these things? Remember, Jesus is very interested in His church. Read Revelation 1 and see Him walking among, in the midst of the candlesticks which represented the seven churches of Asia Minor. He was walking to and fro much as a farmer would be out walking in the field, you know, surveying his crops or whatever. He's looking over his vineyard, looking at his kingdom to see what's going on therein. Sometimes he was very pleased. Other times he was highly displeased. But you see the degree of interest that the Lord has in his church. It is, after all, his church. It's not mine. It's not yours. It's not anybody else's. doesn't belong to Moses. doesn't belong to John. doesn't belong to the Pope. doesn't belong to the Cardinals. It doesn't belong to anyone other than Jesus Christ Himself. How do we know that? He said, upon this rock I will build my church. He built it. What do we know further? We know that He bought and paid for it. What was the price that He gave? Acts 20, 28 says His blood. He purchased it with His blood. I've known of people who were very attached to their farm or their land. And they would sometimes say, I have a lot of blood, sweat, and tears in this place. And it was very important to them. We should never become too attached to the things of this world. But the things for which we have to sacrifice usually means a lot more to us than something that is just handed to us on a platter, as the saying goes. Jesus gave Himself. Did you get that from Ephesians 5? He gave Himself for it. That's the church for which He bled and died. But I want us to look at some practical applications of this and see what kind of a church that Jesus really wants. Jesus wants a working church. He told the churches in... uh, In the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 5, he gave instruction, repent and do the first works. Repent and do the first works. He wanted them to be a working church. He wanted them to get back to what they were doing at the outset. But there may be an idea attached to this statement that we hadn't thought much about. Remember Jesus back in the Sermon on the Mount? said, Seek you first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, verse 33. Notice the word first appears in both passages. We are to put the work of the church first. In Titus 3, verse 1, Paul told Titus, I want you to instruct the people to be sure that they obey the powers that be. 
to obey the magistrates and so on. But he closes that verse by saying, Teach them to be ready unto every good work. To always be in a state of readiness and preparation. We talked or mentioned earlier the disaster relief work. There are many, many people who give to that good work throughout the year. And things are bought and purchased so that they will be ready to load those semi-trailers and take off to wherever a disaster has happened. And it has brought honor and glory to the Lord's church over and over again. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Paul reminded the brethren at Corinth to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We can abound and do abound in a lot of things. But we are to abound in the work of the Lord. In John 5, verse 17, Jesus simply stated of Himself and His Father, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. That is, my Father has worked before me. And we read the account of creation and the fact that He rested or ceased from His labors in the creation of the universe, the world, and all therein. I don't know if Jesus is alluding to only that, perhaps not, but he, we know that His Father worked, and He continues to orchestrate the things that are ongoing in the world that He created. We see the hand of God really every day as we view the beautiful firmament firmament at night and behold the glorious world in which we live, created by our Heavenly Father. And Jesus said, I work also. We need to follow the example of God the Father and God the Son and be actively involved in the work of the Lord. But we learn also that we need to grasp the urgency of this matter of working. I think that's what Jesus was conveying in John 9 verse 4 when He said, I must work the works of Him that sent Me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. There is a time period, a window of opportunity, if you want to view it that way, in which you have time to be productive. But then... The night of death will come and you will no longer be able to carry on the routines that you presently carry on. So many times people see nothing for which to be thankful. I'll quote W.A. Gibbs, the great philosopher from Stonewall, Tennessee, just told me this morning, said, I'm thankful to God to be able to get out of bed and move around. That's a wonderful attitude to have. We need to be thankful for this time of opportunity. And we need to be working in the kingdom of the Lord. The Lord wants a working church. He doesn't want a lazy church. He doesn't want an indifferent church. He wants a working church. In the second place... Jesus wants a loving church. What kind of love? Well, we begin by love for the Lord Himself. Remember? First and greatest commandment is this, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. The second was, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But notice He begins, He said, This is the first and great command. We are to love the Lord. That means that we want to please Him. We want to do things that will make Him happy. We want to do things that will bring Him honor and glory. It's amazing how much you can get done if you don't worry about who gets the credit. It's amazing how good a ball team you can be if you're not concerned about who gets the glory and the honor. That you just function as a team. We've all seen teams that had star athletes. They didn't do so well. 
But you've seen other people that had no one outstanding player. And that team just did remarkably well. They didn't care who received the accolades. They just got down to the business of the task at hand. We need to love the Lord and give Him the honor and glory and credit. And not be worried about our getting recognition. That will come later on from the Lord Himself when He says, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of the Lord. We're to love the lost. In Luke 19.10, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Does it bother you that people are lost? Do you lose any sleep over the fact that people are lost? Do you pray diligently for those that are lost? Be honest. Let's think about it. Stop and analyze our own role in life. I bumped a cart the other day, a shopping cart at Walmart because someone was just too lazy or in too big a hurry to take it back where it needed to be. They left it on my blind side and I bumped it. Now that bothered me a little bit for a while and I thought, wait a minute, that's not the most important thing in the world. If nothing greater than that ever happens to me, that's nothing at all to worry about. It can be buffed out. So just carry on. But what bothers you more? I heard this a long time ago. A scrape on your new vehicle or a soul that is lost and dying in sin. That helps us put things in perspective, doesn't it? We are to love the lost. We are to have love for one another. Paul spoke to the Thessalonians about the fact that, you know, I really don't have to tell you about this because you all know and are taught of God that you are to have love one for another. We're to love one another. Sometimes we begin to take each other for granted, don't we? That happens in marriages and sometimes it happens in churches too. We should never take one another for granted. We need to love one another, not bite and devour one another as some in Galatia was evidently doing but to love one another. Heard a long time ago that some fella said, oh, I'm telling you what, I love my wife so much when I married her that I could have just eaten her, and now I wish I had. But we, we should never develop that attitude. John said he loved Gaius in 3 John verse 1. Gaius was much loved by John. And Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another even as I have loved you. How did He love us? He gave Himself for us. And we must give ourselves to those that we love. We're to love even our enemies. Jesus said, Love your enemies. Matthew 5, verse 44. It's a little bit different in Luke 6, verse 35. But it makes the same point that we are to love those who may not love us. And we're to do good unto them. And when we leave our first love, Jesus is very disappointed. You see, he talked to the churches of Asia about their first works. And he talked to them about their first love. And that passage in Matthew 6.33 could be applied here too. Seek you first the kingdom of God. Let it be first in your affections. Let it be first in your priorities. So we are to seek our first love. He told these brethren, I have somewhat against you because you have left your first love. The church is, and the, our Lord is to be our first love. Jesus wants a loving church. Thirdly, He wants a going church. We've all heard this, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16, 15. Go and teach all nations, Matthew 28, 19. We support various missionaries in various places and some of you have been into distant places. I have done some mission work in the States and I've never been to India or anywhere like that. 
but uh, we have encouraged and promoted that type of work. And if we, it has been said, Brother Bradfield used to say, if you can't go across, come across. What he meant by that was, if you cannot go personally, then you give so that other people can. And we have really helped support lots of works uh, over the last many years, the history of the church here, even back to its inception when it began meeting here. We were established as some type of mission work. Congregation in Nashville helped uh, because the church here split over the matter of instrumental music many, many years ago. And those who desired to uh, worship as God's Word directs without instrumental music and worship began to meet right on these premises. read the history just a few weeks ago of some of the early activities of the Lord's Church at this place. But... We go into all the world. We're to go into the highways. Remember the marriage feast and the setting of of that parable that Jesus taught in Matthew 22? And he talks about the fact that when those who were bidden would not come, he told his servants, you go out into the highways. You see, so many times we have the field of dreams mentality. We'll build a church building and they will come. That doesn't work usually in the spiritual side of life. It may work in the sports side. You build that baseball field, you know, and they will come. The last One of the last scenes in that movie is all those lights of those vehicles coming to that baseball field. Jesus didn't say, go and sit in a church building and everything will be fine. He said, you go out into the highways and you bid people come in. Well, we hang our shingle out. We have our sign out. We have that flashing sign now even. And so we, well, they know we're here. If they want to come, they'll come. The vast majority of people, probably above 90% of people, who attend services at a particular place or visit the services of a religious group do so for one primary reason, a personal invitation. Study after study has revealed that. So we need to be inviting people. Have you ever invited uh, one of the clerks at Walmart? Barbara and I went through the line one time several, well, maybe a couple of years ago and as Barney Fife said, I looked at Barbara and said, she ain't from around here. I realized she was from somewhere else. So I said, are you new in our area? I could tell by her accent. Her speech betrayed her. And she said, oh, I've moved here from so-and-so. And I immediately said, we'd love to have you come visit us in our services. She was very gracious she has never come but she appreciated that invitation and who knows that might come back into her mind one of these days so we need to make contact with people go out into the highways to the unlikely places and invite people to our services try to set up a study with them go to the lost sheep Jesus told the disciples right after he chose them the twelve he said Don't go to the Samaritans. Don't go in the way of the Gentiles. I want you to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Remember, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. He said, I want you to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. These people were Israelites, but they were lost. They're people who have been children of God and have been faithful for a while. But they've fallen away. They need to be restored. Galatians 6 verse 1 tells us that we are to restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering ourselves lest we also be tempted. Paul told the brethren at Rome that he was going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. He was taking the collection that had been taken up for the needy people in Jerusalem from among the Gentile churches. 
Isn't that a beautiful picture? The Jews and the Gentiles had been so separated. Now they had been brought together in Christ. And you have the Gentiles having received the gospel as it were from the Jews. Now reciprocating and giving in material things to those very people who had brought them the gospel. What a beautiful picture that is. We're to do good unto all men especially those of the household of faith. Galatians 6, verse 10. We are to go to the gatherings too. When we assemble, all of us need to be present. We need to be a going church in the sense that we know that all of our brethren are assembling at a certain place, designated place of meeting. So let's go and be there and not forsake that assembly. The Lord wants a going church. Finally, He wants a faithful church. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. In Luke 16, verses 11 and 12, you find out that if a man will not be faithful in reference to the things of another, then he probably won't be faithful at all. The story is told of a father-in-law who was trying to get his son-in-law interested in the family business. But he told him one day, son, we're going to have to build this house and uh, you're going to be supervising the construction of it. And I uh, want you to build it now like we've always built houses. This young man decided that uh, he would save some money. And so he bought number two lumber instead of number one. Instead of putting everything on 12-inch or 16-inch centers, he went to two feet. He bought the cheapest materials throughout. Finally, he concluded the house, went to his father-in-law and said, We've got the house done now. He said, well, congratulations. That's your house. You're going to be living in it. I am giving that house to you and to my daughter. He built the house that he lived in, but he wasn't a good steward. He could not be faithful in that which belonged to another. We've already seen to whom does the church belong. It belongs to the Lord, doesn't it? It's not ours, it's His. If we cannot be good stewards of that which belongs to another, then we're going to fail miserably. Paul described Timothy as faithful in the Lord. He described the brethren in Christ at Colossae. He said, you are faithful brethren. And we all know that passage, Revelation 2.10, be faithful unto death and you will be given a crown of life. We quote that many, many times over. (coughs) That's in Revelation 2.10. But I want you to take a look sometime at Revelation 2.13. The Lord puts a face on faithfulness. In verse 10, He said, Be faithful unto death. In verse 13, He says, I want you to remember Antipas, my faithful martyr. I want you to remember that this man died among you for my faith. He gave his life because he wanted to be faithful to the Lord. So that's just not a cliche. There is an example three verses later that puts a face to it. Jesus still inspects his church. 
He knows whether our works are good or evil. A thought-provoking question is, what would he write to the church at Carthage? When he wrote some of those letters, he called names. He called Antipas by name. Would he find an Antipas here? Who would give his life willingly for the cause? Would he find a Jezebel? Would he find a Balaam? Would he find the one who taught the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? Think about it. What would he write to the church here? It wasn't this suit, but I bought a new suit some time back. And I'd had it for a week or two. I ran my hand in a pocket to see if I could find my glasses or something. I thought, there's cards. Pulled out these little cards. There were not just a couple or three of them. I think there was, I think I ended up counting eight or ten. And on each one of those cards, the same thing was written. It said, Final Inspection by Number Two. Are you ready for the final inspection? By Jesus the Christ. If you're an erring child of God or one who has never obeyed the gospel, we've already told you what to do in this lesson. If you have a desire to become a part of the church that Jesus built and for which he bled and died, let your desires be known as we stand and sing. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing? Following the contribution, we'll sing number 726 in preparation for the Lord's Supper. Let us pray. Your Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this land that you've given us to live in. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the many, many blessings we receive each and every day of our life. Especially thank you for our health and our job and our ability to go out and work and earn a portion of this world good. Pray, Heavenly Father, as we're about to give back now, that we would give back cheerfully 
and the offering taken here today might be used to help those that are in need and to spread the borders of our kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God and Father in heaven, we're indeed thankful for another beautiful Lord's Day that you've blessed us with. We thank you for the opportunity we have to gather around our table each first day of the week in remembrance of Jesus who suffered and died that cruel death on the cross for our sins. Pray, Heavenly Father, as we partake of this unleavened bread, which so fitly represents the body of our Lord that hung on that cross, that we do so in a manner well pleasing as to thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
like manner, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cup, for the vine, which to us as Christians represents that precious blood that Jesus shed on the cross for the remission of our sins. Pray, Heavenly Father, as we partake of it, we do so in a manner well pleasing unto thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Closing hymn this morning will be number 44, 44. Following the singing of that song, we'll be led in our closing prayer by Michael Hackett. <coughs> we appreciate so much the presence of each and every one of you this morning, especially those who are visiting with us and among our visitors are Tyler and Tanika Trusty of Hearing Carthage, their guests of Tracy Haskin, and we are happy to have them with us this morning. We have several people who are ill and on our sick list, and uh, we'll mention those. We will uh, uh, remind you that Carol Woodard's aunt, Dorothy Fitz, passed away on uh, Wednesday, the 23rd. The funeral is today in McMinnville. We want to see, extend our sympathy uh, to uh, her. And also to Alan White and family in the recent death of his great-grandmother, Miss Annie Massey, who was such a sweet lady. And that memorial service was conducted yesterday <coughs> at Sanderson Funeral Home at 1 p.m. Uh, we also want to mention uh, Gail Vincent repro uh, is with us today and improving following recent oral surgery. And uh, she's not going to have any chemo or radiation treatments. They will not be needed, and we're thankful for that. <coughs> Hale Wright's sister, Faye McKay, is going home today. Uh, after knee replacement surgery and rehab, and uh, we are gl glad that she is doing better. Sister Sue Walker will begin taking treatments tomorrow in Lebanon, and let's keep Sue and Durell <coughs> and all of that family in our prayers as well. Two precious souls responded to the invitation last Wednesday night, Delisa White and Donnie Apple, both requesting prayers for strength and forgiveness. We have these thank you notes also. Uh, the Carthage Church of Christ, my family and I would like to thank uh, you for the thoughts, prayers, and the sandwich plate that was, were given at the passing of Mrs. Annie J. Massey. It's great to know we have the love and support of our church families during a hard time in life. Thank you so very much, and Christian love, Alan White and family. And also from the J.T. Jones family, we would like to express our sincere appreciation for your love, kindness, and prayers during this time of great sadness. Signed, the Jones family. 
Uh, let's see. Birthdays include Sarah Malden, Laura Pepper, <clears throat> and Gordon Jenkins on the 27th. Carolyn Hill on the 28th. Yay Yeaman and Barry Cahoon on the 30th. And Pat Paysinger on the 31st. And Rick and Melinda Spivey will celebrate their wedding anniversary on the 30th. So congratulations to all of these. Uh, uh, commodities for Tennessee Children's Home. We need liquid laundry detergent and paper towels. You can leave the... <coughs> Please excuse me. Uh, picked up. They'll be picked up October 3rd. And the food line will be running tomorrow at Disaster Relief. <clears throat> and uh, they will be loading beginning at 10 a.m. And so if you can help, uh, please with, uh, do that. Tennessee Prison Ministry Outreach. They are in need of items to be dispensed uh, to the uh, inmates. And uh, you can check the, the copy of the list on the bulletin board. And those need to be brought to the church building by uh, October 15th. So keep that in mind if you would. And we need to mention the singing at Baghdad this afternoon at 2 p.m. will be the fourth Sunday, Jackson County singing. We'll have our Bible classes in just a few minutes. Hope you'll stay for those. <clears throat> and then be back tonight at 6 o'clock. Tonight will be singing night. It'll be a wonderful time to praise our Heavenly Father in song. So we hope that you'll come and be with us for that. Are there any other announcements that need to be made? Let's stand for the closing song and prayer, please. Almighty Father in heaven, we truly count it a, a blessing to many who have been here this morning, Father, to hear another portion of thy divine word. Father, now we, as we dismiss, we go into our Bible study classes. We pray, Father, that you continue to be with us, that you open up our minds and hearts to accept thy word. Father, strengthen those who are most in need, those that have been mentioned. Father, we know there are many others that are in need of thy help. Father, we pray that your love and compassion will be down upon them. Father, now we ask that you would go with us throughout the remainder of this day, throughout the remainder of our days on this earth, that you would continue to guide, guard, and direct us. Bless us and forgive us when we fail thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.